do in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before I get into the substance of my sermon this morning, I want to address something in the Gospel reading that might have made us all cringe a little. It's the part right at the beginning of the reading where it says that the disciples were gathered in a room that was locked for fear of the Jews. Now I say it might make us cringe a little because that opening line can leave us thinking that all Jews were, or perhaps are, enemies of Jesus' followers. And we know where that kind of thinking can lead and has led. So here's where a little bit of knowledge about context can be really helpful as we read through John's Gospel. <coughs> Most scholars now agree that John's Gospel was written around the turn of the century of what is called the Common Era, the first century. If you remember the early days of Christianity, most Christians were Jews, and most of the preaching and teaching about Jesus took place within the context of the synagogue. But near the turn of the first century, Jewish Christians were being actively expelled from synagogues, proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, there's nothing out of sorts here, okay? Just imagine how we would react if someone were to stand up in front of all of us and say something like, uh, my neighbor, Jeff, is the true Messiah of God. Now, we might tolerate that for a little while, but after a bit, we probably begin to think, eh, that kind of, that's not what we're about here. That person doesn't belong here. They need to leave. And I think it's fair to say that such a person would not think too kindly of us afterward. And were he to write a story about the church of Jeff, um, he would not paint us in a very positive light. Especially if we went around saying that Jeff was, uh, the disciples of Jeff were sadly misguided. Such, scholars think, was the situation when the Gospel of John was written. The Christian church was becoming increasingly distinct from Judaism. And there were some pretty raw feelings amongst Christians who had been expelled from Jewish synagogues. And in the Gospel of John, we're able to see how those raw feelings made their way into the story. And I bring all this up because I think it's important for us to acknowledge the biases that are at play in Scripture instead of just rushing past them because they might strike us as embarrassing. And yes, Holy Scripture is the Word of God, but that does not mean that it is totally free from the human biases of its authors. And recognizing those biases can, I think, <coughs> even get a, give us a better understanding of what God is saying to us today through Holy Scripture. Because I don't think that God always wants us to accept such negative first century biases as if they should still be the norm. And not that it needs pointing out, but we don't live in the first century. And we here today are the ones who are discriminated against, or are not the ones who are discriminated against because of what we believe. If anything, we are in a position of power, and it's our Jewish brothers and sisters who are more likely to be discriminated against. Or not believing like we do. So that gets us to the first sentence of this morning's gospel reading. But not to depart totally from the theme of maintaining old biases, I'd like to talk briefly about the star of this morning's gospel reading, Thomas, or Doubting Thomas, as he's sometimes known. Now, over the past 30 years or so, um, it's become something of a trend for preachers to try to uh, exonerate Thomas by pointing out that there must always be room for doubt within a life of faith. And Thomas, preachers have said, gets a bad rap for harboring the doubt that, if we're honest, we all have. And there's nothing wrong about emphasizing the reality that we all have doubt. But the preaching bias about Thomas has gotten to the point where doubting Thomas is sort of exalted as the exemplar for 
for all of us. As if we should all seek to um, cultivate or embrace that. And I think that we need to sort of step back a little bit in this conclusion. Because the clear message of the gospel is have faith. Now sure, it is a great lesson that Thomas was still a part of the community even though he refused to believe. And it's worth pointing out that when Thomas sees the risen Christ, he makes a hugely important statement, my Lord and my God. But Jesus' response to Thomas is, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And John's Gospel tells us pointedly that the stories about Jesus' resurrection are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that through believing, we may have life in his name. And you see, if we're all trying to cultivate doubt and are okay with not believing unless we see, then the danger is that we might all end up tacitly thinking that as long as someone else in the church believes, then it's okay if I don't. But the problem is that if no one in the church has faith in the resurrection. Then the question one day might be asked openly, why are we all gathering? To worship the Jesus in whom no one believes. <laughs> and if everyone ends up saying, I will not believe unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails uh, in, in, in his side, then the church would cease to exist in short order. So I think we may be due for a chastened approach to doubting Thomas. Now, Thomas is not a bad guy for having doubt. And we should never be biased against anyone who does not believe as we do. But neither is Thomas a hero because he had doubt. And we should not be biased towards disbelief. I think instead we might try to occupy a middle ground you know, saying something like, you know, yes, I have my doubts, and I want to see the mark of the nails in his hands, but I can still believe even if I don't see them. Or, more simply, I want to believe, for all you X-Files fans out there. <laughs> Maybe it's even, I want to want to believe. Now, in a few moments, we'll all stand up and recite the Nicene Creed, which begins with the words, we believe. Now it may seem obvious, but the fact that we say we believe every week is really important. I know that not everyone here always agrees with each individual statement in the Creed, but the fact that we can say the Creed together tells me that we're trying as best we can to embrace faith instead of doubt. We're all trying to make sense of the news that Mary Magdalene shared with the disciples almost 2,000 years ago, that Jesus is alive. And if we can say the creed, I think it's fair to say that we, move, we have moved beyond the point of saying, I will not believe unless. And we're in the realm of entertaining belief in the risen Jesus. Even if we have our doubts, we're still saying that having faith is where we want to be. And that may mean we're biased towards faith. But of all biases, I think that's the one it's okay to have.